Well, I think originally, uh, really in a very selfish way, just thinking of a, a good role for myself to play is, uh, <laughs> is how I originally uh, thought about it. But as the years went on and it was so hard to get the film made, it became much more of a life and death uh, situation. So it changed. Did you, when you, were, when you were kind of first had the idea for the film, had you always imagined that you would direct as well, that you would obviously you star in it, you, you wrote it? Did you imagine that it would be you doing all of these things? No, originally I wrote the script for a friend of mine called Roger Michel, a, a great director, and he eventually decided he didn't want to do it. And then uh, I, I had a list with some producers of uh, about six or seven directors who they would accept, and all of them didn't want to do it. And um, at that point, uh, a, a screenplay is a dead thing if it's not made. So uh, it just seemed like such a waste of energy. And I thought, fuck it, I'll try and make it myself, basically. And of course, you've appeared um, in many adaptations of Wilde's work, both on stage and, and on screen. How did that kind of prepare you for, for this project? Um, well, I think uh, I, I have a natural... Uh, pr propensity as a kind of, uh, it's a dirty word almost nowadays, but as a light comedian uh, for uh, the, 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 the text of Oscar Wilde to start with. So I was quite lucky in, in the theater playing him. And then um, in a couple of movies uh, also, it seemed to work out very well for me. So this seemed like uh, the next step in a way. And do you think there's a certain kind of art to performing Wilde's dialogue? Not particularly. It's like riding a bicycle. Either you can do it or you can't. And um, Wilde himself has been portrayed on screen a few times before. What was it about what you wanted to achieve with this film that you thought separated it from those things that we've seen already? I think uh, time has moved on slightly since the other Wilde films because the first one was made in, I think, 1957, uh, which was a very risky time to make a film about Wilde. The second one in the 1970s, which was still uh, not a safe time. So everyone was slightly more reverential uh, towards him. And then... Um, the latest one, which was also, I don't know, 1992, um, it, it felt a little bit too sanitized still for me. I, I feel the great thing about Wilde is uh, the humanity of him and uh, the, the, the human frailty, if you like. Um, he was a huge star who really uh, thought the whole world was revolving around him. And, so, and, and, the, and the colossal snob and all these things I find very attractive. <laughs> Um, the decision to to um, to follow the final few years in his life, um, where did that kind of first come from? Was it always your intention that you wanted to to portray him after he was released from prison? Um, well, mostly because the other films about Wilde always end when he goes into prison, and for me, uh, the the really interesting part, the romantic, uh, fantasiac, the end of the nineteenth century melodrama and tragedy, is Wilde in exile, and uh, for me, it's one of the, it's one of the great images of the end of the 19th century. And do you think, because it's something about uh, time in Wilde's life that we know slightly less about, perhaps, that it gives you more freedom as an actor to do something to do something different, to give him a different kind of energy or life? Well, um, what are you saying? That it's not, it's quite accurately, I mean, it, it, most of it actually happened. I, I didn't make it up for the most part. Uh, I think, uh, no, the, he was, you know, along with Verlaine, uh, the last of the 19th century's great vagabonds. You know, he, he sat catching drinks on the boulevard, toothless, smelling slightly of piss, and, uh, and that was the end of one of uh, the world's most famous people. And uh, I just think that's a, a fascinating story to tell. Um, well, I just was portraying as him as I see him. You know, his, the great thing about history is that history is what you want it to be. Uh, I wanted Oscar to be that character. Um, uh, for me, he is... Uh, a kind of lech, a drunk, um, marvelous sense of humor, incredible compassion on the one hand, an amazing snob on the other, all the kind of things that, that all of us have inside. Um, I think he is. Uh, I also think he's a kind of, for me, a kind of Christ figure. Uh, he's, a, as I said before, he's a man and God, uh, genius and idiot. And I find uh, that's the story I wanted to tell, really. Oh, I just zipped myself into a fat suit. Um, <laughs> I, I suppose my, my um, approach is a, an old-fashioned approach. It's much more from the outside in rather than from uh, the kind of American approach, which is from the inside out. And uh, so the first thing I got 
was this amazing fat suit uh, made by a guy in London uh, with all sorts of different areas. The, the, the arse was this low-hanging, <laughs> soft thing made of kind of feathers. And uh, he had am amazing moobs, kind of low-hanging baboon tits. Uh, at first, I had him with a gigantic cock. Um, <laughs> with balls made of um, dried peas. But when I tried it out in the theater at first, and I was wearing this very tight suit, it was all wedged inside. And in the theater, I could see the front row of the audience just like. <laughs> and they were saying, my God, I never knew Rupert Everett was that well hung. And it kind of uh, took over from the play. So I had to have an operation and uh, <laughs> cut the size of it down. But that's how it started. And then I wore a, a corset over the fat suit. And I had some amazing teeth made, which plump out the inside of your face. And then I was ready to go. Difficulties, uh, endless difficulties, because uh, it's just uh, almost impossible getting independent films made now, even if you're a very successful filmmaker. Uh, as an unknown filmmaker, um, middle-aged, uh, I think it was, uh, it was, it was fairly difficult. Uh, and so it took me years uh, to get it together. Eight to ten years, I think it took ten years altogether. I think he considered the, the the amazing thing about Oscar and why for me also he's like Christ is that when he ended up after the second court case, they took him to the Cadogan Hotel and he had about six hours before the um, uh, the police issued the warrant for his arrest and he had six hours in which he could leave England, and uh, at that point he would have uh, become an exile and uh, could have gone on living, and he decided to sacrifice himself. And I think he sacrificed himself because he weighed up very cleverly that he would not achieve any kind of immortality for his career if he ran away. Because in fact, the fact of the matter was there were, there were plenty of other playwrights more famous than he was at the time in London. And uh, really his, his, his durability as, a, as, a, as an icon is really about uh, him as well as his work. Uh, I think so. Um, he could have. He 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 made the decision to to sacrifice himself. I think. Um, well, I think I I was sympathetic to Olivia de Havilland. I think she was portrayed stupidly in that series. Um, and I think if you are going to deal with historical characters, you uh, you really have a, a a duty to try and portray them as you feel they really are, and to look into them uh, quite deeply because it's, um, it's, it's irritating to create myths that aren't true about people. Um, I worked very much in tandem with uh, Wilde's grandson, Oscar w um, Merlin Holland, and uh, in fact, he came and saw the movie on Monday, and I think, apart from the fact that he doesn't think that Wilde uh, had syphilis, and I think maybe he did, uh, um, I think we, he, he was... Um, he was pleased with uh, the way that I saw Wilde. But anyway, I really did see Wilde with my whole heart. I didn't try and lie about what I thought about him. It's what I, it's what I think about him. So I think it's important that. I think it was definitely a, an advantage, actually. Uh, the, more, the longer you have to think about a thing, normally what happens is uh, you get bored with the, the idea. And so I felt that I tested every single part of it over those eight to 10 years. And yes, I think you're right, but one of the great things, the lucky things for me, was having such an amazing cast of actors because none of them really needed any kind of direction at all. They were instinctively uh, excellent in the, in the movie, I thought. The, I wrote the film 10 years ago, and the David, I did the David Hare play because I was trying to figure out a way of getting the film financed, and I kept hitting a brick wall, and I suddenly thought, if I could play Oscar Wilde in the theater, maybe I would be able to drum up some uh, interest. And so I talked to David and uh, a producer friend of mine, and we put the play together. Uh, but the script actually was all uh, written years before, and, um, and luckily, because of David's play, the whole thing began to come together. So it was very important for me. But I didn't, um, it, it, I didn't write the script from David's play. It was very, very peculiar to be spat on by everybody, I must say. I mean, seriously, it was, it was uh, A, at first funny, and then nasty, and, and the feeling of it. Because it, that actually happened, the scene in Clapham Junction. Um, it's, um, he was spat on by a, a, a big crowd of people. And, um, but when you're making films, it become, you, you don't, uh, you're in such a hurry to finish the day or you've got something terrible going wrong. You don't quite think of it except uh, in, 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 in the terms that you probably wonder about it afterwards. Um, it's all a technical um, challenge, mostly. Um, 
But um, putting it together, you know, you always hope it, that's the effect it's going to have. They are, they're both true scenes. Um, the, the scene the chase, being chased through the town is a true scene, and uh, Clapham Junction is a true scene. But particularly, I did find, yes, being spit, spat on was uh, a very, very troubling thing to happen. I just wanted to ask, I mean, we've talked a lot about kind of themes and content in the film, but it's really distinctive in the way it looks. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your kind of visual approach to the, the story. Um, well, I w wanted it to be, um, my joke about it at the beginning was I wanted it to have a Visconti meets CCTV aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wanted to have amazing uh, decoration and depth and color, but I didn't want it to be dwelt on, just as I didn't want the dialogue to be dwelt on or the costumes to be dwelt on, but I wanted them all to be there. And then I wanted it to be really, I ripped off um, a, a, direct, a couple of directors called the Dardenne Brothers, and they have a trick, which is they have a, an actor look into the camera at a certain point, and then the camera follows the actor. And a lot of their films are just played on the back of an actor taking you into the various uh, bits of drama, and it's incredibly effective. And so I cribbed that. Uh, and, uh, and at the beginning of my film, Oscar looks into the camera when he says it's a dream, and then the camera, he is, not to f sound too wanky, but the camera and he establish a kind of relationship once you look into the camera, and then the camera becomes a kind of character following there, uh, always with him. And so uh, that's, that's what I was trying to achieve. It was built by Jacob Epstein, and it was put into um, in uh, Père Lachaise in September 1914, just before the Second First World War, uh, inaugurated by um, Oh, some very weird character. Anyway, it had a, it also had these um, these huge balls <laughs> talking about, uh, which got ripped off and um, were found 30 years later in the gardener's cottage in Père Lachaise, <laughs> being being used as a paperweight. <laughs> um, and um, he was reburied there in 1914 because at first he was buried outside of Paris, and uh, it's a very weird. It's like a kind of big filing cabinet, that um, tomb. It's, uh, for me, it's not very attractive, but it's the most popular tomb in Père Lachaise, including uh, um, uh, Callas, including uh, Chanel, including tons of people. So it's a destination that's very, very popular, and it was kissed to death. So now they've had to put a glass uh, case around it because the, the lipstick uh, eroded the stone. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Rupert, you mentioned this as your, your first film as director. Um, do you have intentions of, of continuing directing now? Um, I would like to. Uh, you know, I, if it took me another 10 years, I'd be 68, so it'd probably be... Uh, I don't think I'd do that. If, if I could make something happen a bit quicker and I, so I could manage, I would love to. But I think uh, making films is quite a young person's uh, pursuit in a way. I feel like I'm a, a, like a bicycle without any brake pads. And in the downhill bits, I was kind of out of control slightly. <laughs> well, I think we're all certainly hoping that we see something again from you very soon. Rupert, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you very tonight. much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.